I'm a girl, and this happened when I was 20 in the early 2000s. Landlines were still common, and cell phones were not unlimited. This happened in a town about an hour away from Sacramento. My friend was house-sitting for a family that her family was friends with from church. She was to house-sit in the country just outside of town for a week. They had animals like cats, rabbits, a donkey, and a horse. The family also had dogs too, but the family took the dogs with them. My friend was in charge of feeding the animals and watching the place. She didn't have to get the mail daily, because they had this metal lockbox style mailbox down their long driveway. They didn't have any neighbors for miles, just fields of alfalfa, cattle, and corn, so I assumed the lockbox was for safety. Towards the end of the week, she asked if I wanted to spend the night and keep her company, and I thought it sounded fun. I had moved out of my aunt and uncle's place and gotten my own apartment so I told her I'd pick her up on the way there after I got out of work. We got there around 9.30pm, grabbing dinner along the way. We went into the barn first thing and fed the animals. It was late for their dinner, and they made their hunger known with their animal noises. We made sure they had water, then went inside. The house was this big ranch style house. Single story. The living room was to the left as you walked into the home. There was a long hallway directly to the right of the entrance that led to where the bathroom and bedrooms were. Straight ahead was a dining area, and to the left of that was a kitchen entrance and a patio door. They did not have an open floor plan. In the kitchen, on the opposite side, was also a long hall that had several doors. My friend explained that the wife ran a daycare center out of the house. These rooms were play areas for the kids she took care of. We didn't bother going over there because we had no interest. We watched some TV, ate our leftovers, and talked about people we knew. As it got later, she turned on the house alarm and said she didn't like sleeping in other people's beds, so she had been sleeping on the couch, then offered it to me. She would sleep on one of the two huge recliners that reclined so far back it was almost flat. The chairs were really comfortable, so I just said I'd take the chair. I went and laid back in a chair with my blanket. We turned off the TV and were talking for maybe 20 minutes in the dark when the motion sensor floodlights started shining through the window, lighting up the room. Now. I really have no idea why people in the country think it's okay not to have curtains or blinds, because to me that's insane. We both got quiet, and Amanda says, maybe it was one of the cats? Then we start hearing gravel crunch, like a person walking across gravel in the parking area outside. My chair was closest to the window and I slid carefully down to the floor, clutching the stupid blanket the whole time. The floodlight timed out, and my friend slid to the floor too. We laid on our stomachs in the dark, not knowing what to do for a minute, when we heard a loud bang, and all of a sudden, the house alarm started blaring, and the floodlights turned on again. It was so loud, we covered our ears and I started a panic. I swear I have never been so close to peeing my pants in my life. I began crawling towards the keypad for the security, because I've seen the commercials. There's a button you push and a person responds to you in case of an emergency. Or at least, sends the police. The main screen said, Patio 1 of 2 open. Amanda starts to cry a little, and hits the call assistance button on the pad, and nothing happens. There's no assistance. I asked her where the phone was, and she said there's a phone in the kitchen and one in the parents' room down the hall. Our choices were to go to the kitchen past the windows and next to one of the patio doors, or down the hall to the parents' room and use the phone there. I asked her where the other patio was, and she said it was in the daycare part of the house. It was an easy decision, and we headed to the parents' room. It was pitch black. 
I asked her where the phone was, and she said, I think we have to turn on the light. I really didn't want to, but we had no choice. I didn't have a flashlight, and I didn't bring my cell because I had limited minutes. It was a simpler time, and Amanda didn't even get her own cell until after this happened. She turned on the light, and we started looking around the room. Not only did these people not have curtains on any window, but they didn't even have closet doors. We saw a golf club leaning against the wall by the bed. They probably have it instead of a baseball bat, which is what I had next to my bed at home. We figure if we hit someone with it, it's going to leave a mark. She grabbed it, and we continued our search for the phone. Looking at the obvious places, we find a cordless phone stand, minus the actual phone. All the while, the alarm is still raging. We have a light on and the person who opened the patio door is bound to notice is all I'm thinking at this point. Amanda asks, should we use the locate phone buttons? I look at her and respond, yeah, if you want some strange guy coming in here with it and asking us if we were looking for something. I was getting mad that I was scared and in this situation. Standing there knowing that we had to go to the kitchen, the house alarm stopped. It got quiet. Country quiet. If you've lived in the country, you know what I'm talking about. There wasn't another golf club for me to grab, so I made her go out first, flipping every light on and keeping the doors we passed in the hall closed. We double checked the security panel, and it still says patio open. We hit the call button, but it still didn't work. After double checking the front door was locked, we started for the kitchen. I told her we had to check the patio near the kitchen, and I grabbed a big knife that wasn't even close to being sharp. We checked the patio door near the kitchen, and it was locked. We turned on all the lights and grabbed the phone and dialed 911. The phone wasn't a cordless phone. It's one of the old ones with a cord attached on the wall. Amanda's on the phone with a dispatcher, telling her what happened, and I hear a whistle coming from outside the kitchen window. The thing people don't think about, because I didn't in my thinking that safety was turning on the lights, is that while you have the reflection of the inside on the window, people on the outside have a very clear view of you, unless you press your face against the window. I heard the whistle again. It sounded like someone trying to get someone else's attention but I didn't see anything outside, and I was not about to press my face to the window to see if I was the person they were whistling for. Amanda was still talking to the dispatcher and was crying and saying she didn't have the address to the house. She then handed me the phone. The dispatcher, sounding annoyed, told me she needed an address to send the police to. I asked if she could try and trace the call, but responded with, you're house sitting and you don't even know where you're at? Scared, angry, and overwhelmed, I handed the phone back to Amanda and started looking for something with an address in the kitchen. I was looking at the junk drawer, on the counter, on the refrigerator, fully keeping an eye down the hall that has the daycare rooms, knowing that on the other side of one of those doors is a patio door that was open. Amanda tells the lady that she doesn't pick up the mail because of their lockbox and then a few seconds later removes the phone from her ear and stared at me with a blank face. I asked her if they're tracing the call because I couldn't find anything with an address. Amanda said lowly. She said, I hope the police find you in time and then just hung up on me. At that point, I was pissed and scared at the same time. We knew that there were people outside. We knew that the patio door to the daycare area was opened. What we did not know was what to do. We stood in the kitchen silent for what seemed like forever, but was probably only a minute. I picked up the phone and dialed 411. I told Amanda that they would have the number to the police department. As calmly as I could, I explained what was happening to us. 
I included the 911 dispatcher and said we really needed the phone number of the town's police department when we heard a huge metal bang outside the kitchen window by the patio door. It sounded like someone dropped something heavy and made of metal. Amanda started crying and I couldn't hold in my fear anymore and started crying too. Whoever was outside was going to break open that patio door was what was going through my head. The 411 operator said they were connecting us and would stay on the line with us after getting pissed at the 911 dispatcher on our behalf. A police officer answered the phone and the 411 operator started explaining what was happening to the police. Then they were asked to disconnect once we had an established connection. The police asked a few questions and we heard the whistle again outside and floodlights all around the house turned on again. I was too scared to look outside and we had never turned on the patio light because we had to walk across the patio window to get to the switch. We told the policeman on the phone about the whistle and he said that there should be several policemen showing up shortly and to stay on the phone. We were outside the town limits and knew it might take a few minutes. Having an officer on the phone made me feel a little bit better, but I was still really scared. He told us that the police arrived and were coming up the drive. The policeman said to put down the phone and open the door, so I did. What I saw was a police pickup truck with spotlights flashing into the pastures that ran along both sides of the drive. Two officers with shotguns instead of handguns were walking slowly beside the truck as it came up the long drive. Four officers approached the house, asking us our names. One went to the phone to inform the 411 operator that they had arrived. They ordered us to stay in the dining room and began searching the house. One by one, they returned. The last one came back in through the patio door by the kitchen. He told us he searched the barn and was caught by surprise by the horse as the horse itself was spooked. He also asked what other animals were in the barn. They told us they didn't find anyone and that the daycare patio was unlocked. There was, however, a broom handle on the track to prevent it from being opened too far. I looked at the patio door that the officer entered in and saw that there was not a broom handle on that one then felt dumb because he just walked through it. They lectured Amanda about not knowing the address of the house she was supposed to be responsible for and other stuff I can't recall. After finishing statements, they said they'd stick around and look more and if we wanted to leave, we could. They could lock the bottom lock, but not activate the alarm, but we were fine with that. We were out of there so fast. We got into my car and went to Amanda's mom's house. We were so mentally exhausted we fell asleep shortly after arriving, and the next morning I had to go back to work. Amanda said she really didn't want to go back to the house, but she had to feed the animals their breakfast. Her mom told her to take her sisters with her, so she did. Later that afternoon, she called me while I was at work. I could tell Amanda was shaken as she began going over details of what she found when she returned. The first thing she found were footprints made from either mud or animal feces. I suggested it was probably the cop that checked the barn, but I could tell she wasn't fully buying that. When she and her sisters went into the barn to feed and water the animals, they found that someone had tied all the rabbits' legs together in their hutches. The last thing she found, which was definitely the most eerie, was a pizza coupon with the word LUCKY scribbled on the back of it on the floor of the kitchen. Neither of us tried ordering pizza the night before, and we knew the coupon wasn't there before either. Amanda found the coupon flyer on the refrigerator, and wouldn't you know it, it was missing one. After Amanda and her sisters untied the rabbit's legs and cleaned up, she asked her mom to find someone else from their church to finish house-sitting, because she definitely wasn't going back. Amanda later updated an officer on what she found when she returned to the house. 
Unfortunately, the police couldn't, or in my opinion, likely didn't, do anything about it after the fact. Even though there was no property damage, we thought it would be prudent that they check for prints along some of the patio locks, or even inside the house. But we never received any more details on the matter, so obviously nobody was ever caught. Either way, it was easily one of the most frightful nights of our lives. <laughs>